Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to this wonderful Thursday night. I am so glad you're here. And on this particular Thursday night, guess what? It's tomorrow on Friday that I will be coming back from Scotland. So we will be together next Thursday, God willing. And uh, I'll have all kinds of great pictures and all kinds of wonderful stories, God willing. But here tonight, look at the title, Millennial Reign. So Isaiah 11 is a major chapter in the book of Isaiah for the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And I just want to remember what we studied last time. Remember, I'm not going to go into any of this, but I want to go a different direction. We're going to hit this same verse. We did, a shoot will come forth out of the stump of Jesse, right? So remember the first time, man, a branch will grow out of his roots, and the spirit of Yahweh will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge, and the fear of Yahweh. So we see the sevenfold Holy Spirit. Uh, again, so we have the spirit of Yahweh. He's Yahweh himself. That's one. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of Yahweh. We have the sevenfold Holy Spirit, and the three are one. So the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. So a shoot will come forth. So of course, he is Yahweh himself, but he will first come as a man. And that's the whole point. Yahshua HaMashiach. Yahshua the Messiah. Or Jesus the Messiah, if you speak English. Uh, Yahshua, of course, means Yahweh saves. Ha means the. Mashiach means Messiah. Or in Greek, uh, the Christ. Okay, so Yahshua HaMashiach. He is God and man. One thing that I want you to keep in mind during this entire lesson, and I've told you this countless times before, right now there is a man, a glorified man sitting on the throne in heaven. Contemplate that. There is a glorified man sitting on the throne in heaven right now. Now the question I want you to ask yourself and contemplate every day of your life, and this will change who you are, is why was that necessary? Why was that necessary? Yahweh loved us with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31.3 He has loved us. That means the love started in eternity past. And he has loved us with an everlasting love. That means the love goes into eternity future. And it's for that reason that knowing that we would fall... Uh, what does Acts 15 say? That known to God before the foundation of the earth are, are all, his, all his acts. Everything he would ever do are already known to him before he created us. That's why 1 Peter 1.20 says that God predestined his son Jesus Christ to die for us before the foundation of the world. Why would he do that? Because his love for us is everlasting and Yahweh is omniscient. He already knew that we would sin. He already knew before creating us that he, he, he must give us free will for us to choose to love him, for us to choose to follow him. Without free will, there is no faith. We're not robots. He doesn't want robots. Do you want your husband or wife to be with you because they're forced to or because they want to be with you? Isn't it so much better not to be forced to be in a relationship or think you have to stay because of benefits or something like that? Isn't it wonderful to actually love the person you're with and to know that they want to be with you? There's no compulsion there. So Yahweh so loved us, knowing that he must give us free will, knowing that we would use that free will to reject him, Yet, he had already predestined his son to die for us because he already loved us. Therefore, because of his love for us, he predestined his son to pay the penalty of our rebellion, of our sin, of our rejection of him. And all who put their faith in him will not only be saved, but will be glorified and will be ushered into the most amazing time of history the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, and then the eternal state when the Father comes. The purpose of all these things. There are three who testify in heaven. The Father, the Logos, or as it says in English, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, realize that before, before Yahweh Logos came into the world as a human, 
he was called Yahweh Logos. The essence, the manifestation of Yahweh, the, the tangible manifestation of all that Yahweh is, that's the, um, the theological definition of the Logos. And the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. But whenever he came into the world, whenever he became human in order to die to save us, he took on the title of Yahshua, Yahweh saves. And what did Yahweh say? I, today I have begotten you. I will be to you as a father and you will be to me as a son. That's the message all throughout the Bible. Very interesting. We see Yahweh Logos in eternity past. He's the creator of all things. He's Yahweh. Then he comes in human form and he will be called the son of the most high God. And he will be called Yahshua because Yahweh has come to save his people. Now in Revelation chapter 19, notice that he's not only called Yahshua anymore. He's still called Yahshua. That will forever be his name. But he's also gone back to being called the Logos. Read Revelation chapter 19. And his name was the Logos of God, the Word of God. So remember this going through life and never forget, because the ramifications are huge, that there is a glorified man sitting on the throne in heaven. And if that doesn't show you the love of God for you and for me, nothing will. The fact that God was willing to do that for his love of us. And the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He came in grace and truth. His grace is unmerited favor. He loves us though we don't deserve it. He gives us what we do not deserve. Yet he also came in truth. Do we want to walk in error? No. Why do you think I teach apologetics every, well, almost every time we're together, I teach you something about apologetics. And also every Monday night, we have an apologetics class. He came in truth. He is the truth. He's the only truth. And it bothers me, it's really bad, whenever quote-unquote Christian organizations stray from the truth and preach a false gospel. That's not good. He came in grace and truth. We need to be truthful, we need to be honest, but we also need to remember to be graceful to the people. God was manifested in the flesh. Depending on your version, if you have the, um, the Waldensian manuscripts that went west, which were all preserved and all say the same thing, that's where the King James and New King James came from, uh, it says God was manifested, in the flesh, was manifested in the flesh. It says Theos was manifested in the flesh. If you have an eastern manuscript that went through the Arian controversy where none of them agree, they were buried in an earthquake, and so some of them do date older, but that's because they were preserved in an earthquake, um, and none of them agreed. It says, he was manifested in the flesh. Well, so was I. <laughs> Guess what? So were you. I trust the Western manuscripts, the Waldensian, that went through the Waldensian line, uh, of which the King James translators had. And it says, Theos was manifested in the flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. And all of those manuscripts agree and are truly from the original apostolic writings. And it has the 1 John 5, 7. It has the Acts 8, 37. It has all the verses that are missing in the new versions. Okay? Now, God was manifested in the flesh. Yahshua, who, being in the form of God, Who's in the form of God besides God? No one. He's in the form of God. He is God. Being in the form of God, he did not consider his equality with God as plunder to cling to. In other words, he didn't say, this is, this is my deity, I'm clinging to it. Another rendering of this verse, and really what it's also saying, is that it's not like the deity, the divinity, his Godhead, his Godship, was something that he had to win or take. He's God from the beginning. He never became God. He's always been God. He is eternal God. His divinity, his deity, his godship was not something he had to take or fight for or earn. It's something that he is because he is the eternal cause of all things. He is Yahweh Elohim, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not plunder. It's not something that he had to take by force or by competition. 
It's not plunder. His equality with God because he is God. And he didn't see the need to cling to it knowing that if he were to take off and pour himself out, he could save mankind. What do you think about that humility? And that's the point of Philippians chapter 2, the humility of Jesus Christ. Instead, he poured himself out. What does it mean to pour yourself out? You used to be full, now you're empty. He left his deity, he left his divinity, even though he's always God, he never quit being God, but he took off the, the, the divine attributes, being spirit, being um, infinite, being all-powerful, being all-knowing, being all places at once. He took off, he poured himself out, and he took the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of a man. Don't read that any other way than how it's written. God became man. Yahweh became man. Not, a, not some kind of mystical spirit looking like a man. Not, a, not Yahweh just taking the form of a man like in the Old Testament, he would come in the form of an angel. They can appear any way they want to, to appear. He became man. He poured himself out. Yahweh in his glorified state cannot die. And notice that Yahshua grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and man. That verse will bother you if you don't understand what I'm telling you. If you don't understand that when the Bible says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, if you don't believe what the Bible says, that God was manifested in the flesh, when it says that God became man and he came as a human being, it means that he poured himself out and he came as a human being. That's what it means. He came to die. Yahshua grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and man. Now, because of his connection, does he know all things? Yeah. Because of his connection... Whatever he asks of the Father, won't it be given to him? Yes, except having the cup taken away. That was the prayer that was not answered, wasn't it? He said, if there's any other way, may this cup pass from me. Him being made our sin. He wasn't afraid of the cross. He went willing to the cross and stretched his arms out. But when it came time to become our sin in the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the man, Jesus Christ, fell to his face was in agony unto death. And if you read closely Hebrews chapter 5, which we've done many times in this class, if the angel had not come to physically minister to him, he would have physically died in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we've already studied that many times in here. I've gone through all the verses with you. Yahweh became a human being. God became man. He will delight in the fear of Yahweh. He will not only judge according to what his eyes see, nor will he rebuke according to what is hear, his ears hear. He will judge the poor with righteousness and the meek with justice. Now, this hasn't happened yet. He came as the tender shoot. He came as the branch. He came to give his life. God became man to die for us. So now we're talking about the millennial reign. We're talking about whenever Yahshua will return and reign he will delight in the fear of Yahweh. He will not judge according to what his eyes see, nor will he rebuke according to what his ears hear. How does Yahweh judge a man? By what he sees or by the heart? By the heart. Now, notice that Yahshua, who had been made a little lower than the angels. So he was Yahweh, the creator of the angels. But then he didn't just take a step down and become an angel. He went all the way to the bottom. He became lower than the angels why? For the suffering of death. Yahshua, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, he has now been crowned with honor and glory so that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for everyone. Now that he has died and now that he has gone to heaven, he has been glorified. In fact, Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore, God, speaking of the Father, has highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Yahshua in the Hebrew, Yahweh saves, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Yahshua is Lord to the glory of the Father. 
So he, we have a glorified man on the throne in heaven who is highly exalted, who has the name above all names. There's no name above, Yah- above Yahweh, and his name is Yahshua. Yahweh saves. What did Yahshua ask his father in John 17, 5? He was ready to go home. He knew that his crucifixion and resurrection and his 40 days after that were coming up. Very soon, he wanted to go back to heaven. Father, glorify me along with yourself with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Wow. Wow. So if that doesn't explain the eternality of Yahshua, I don't know what does. To his son, the father said, your throne, O God. Did you just see that? The father just called the son God. And of course, the son calls the father God. The, to his son, the father says, your throne. Who does the throne belong to? Yahshua. Who gave him that throne? The father. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The father is God. Yahshua is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The three are one. Three persons, one God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Question, based on this verse, who does the throne belong to? The son. Based on this verse, who does the scepter, who does the kingdom belong to? The son. Who has given him all authority on, in heaven and on earth? The father. Because Yahweh does not look at things as mankind looks at them. Mankind looks at outward appearances, but Yahweh looks at the heart. That's why it says what his he will not judge according to what his eyes see, nor will he rebuke according to what his ears hear. He will judge the poor with righteousness and the meek with justice. He will judge between many peoples and rebuke powerful distant nations. They will beat their swords into plowshares, plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer raise sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. That means that during the millennial kingdom, there will be no war, none. There are, there's bad eschatology anywhere you go. But let this serve as, as, a, as a teaching for you that once the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ begins, there will be no more training for war and there will be no more war. At the end of the millennial kingdom, whenever Satan is released for that short time and he gathers all of the unbelievers that are living in the world during the millennial kingdom, There is no war. There is no shot fired. God, the Father himself, sends fire out of heaven and devours them all and sends them all to the lake of fire. There is no war. Uh, So remember that when you're studying the war of Gog and Magog uh, because Jezebel is mentioned both in Revelation and also uh, back with uh, King Ahab, her husband. But remember that we're not talking about the real Jezebel in Revelation. We're talking about the spirit of Jezebel. Don't forget that this, there are spirits behind the powers of these worlds, of this world. So the war of Gog and Magog does not occur at the end of the millennium because there is no war at the end of the millennium. No one is training for war anymore, nor does anyone have swords or any kind of weapons. Yet whenever you read Ezekiel 38 and 39 about the war of Gog and Magog, it is a massive scale war. So it's bad eschatology to think that just because it mentions the spirits behind Gog and Magog in Revelation, to think that that's the war of Gog and Magog, you will create for yourself. Whenever you try connecting dots, you will create for yourself more theological problems putting the war of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennial kingdom. By the way, read the war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and it's the war of Gog and Magog that shows everyone that Yahweh is God and that he's there to reign. Do you mean to tell me that after a thousand years of being on this earth, Jesus Christ, the world doesn't know that he's God and that he rules? Are you, do you mean to tell me that? But that's the culmination of the war of Gog and Magog. So it's bad theology to put the war of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium. Uh, I'm going to save the surprise and all the details once we get to Ezekiel because that is just an amazing study. So just keep that in mind though, okay? Just keep that in mind that one, if you actually do the work and if you actually do the study and if you actually try to connect all the dots and make everything fit, there is no way on earth that you could ever put the war of Gog and Magog at the end of the, at the, end of the millennium. You will create for yourself insurmountable theological problems 
and eschatological problems. Okay. Yahshua HaMashiach, the millennial reign. The Father says to the Son. There's a, there's a conversation between the Trinity in Psalm chapter 2, which we've already studied. We've already been through that. The conversation between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I've already shown you how to divide that and what it all means. Ask me, and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. You will break them with an iron rod. This is the Father speaking to the Son. You will shatter them to pieces like a ceramic pot. Then the Holy Spirit says later, kiss the Son, which means honor the Son. Kiss the Son or He will become angry and all of you will be utterly destroyed from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all who put their trust in Him. Notice what this says. It's the Son of God in whom we may be saved. It is the Son of God who brings salvation. It is the Son of God who saves. But He came the first time as the Lamb. He's coming the second time as the lion. He came the first time as a shoot of David, a shoot of Jesse. He's coming the second time as the king of kings, lord of lords, to reign with an iron rod, okay? And perfect justice and perfect righteousness. He will build the temple of Yahweh and he will bear the glory. He will sit upon his throne and rule, so he's the king. He will be the royal priest. He's king and priest. And there will be a perfect harmony between his kingship and his priesthood. We already went over this last week, so I won't spend too much time on that, but this is defining the millennial kingdom. He will be not only the theocratic ruler, he will be the spiritual ruler, and he will be the only king. He will be the king of the universe, which he already is, but he will finally come to rule. I write these things to you so that none of you sins, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahshua Messiah, the righteous. Remember what we had just said here. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist. Faithfulness will be the belt around his heart. So let's take a look at exactly what this means. Whenever we say justice around his waist, we're saying a just government. This is his kingship. Righteousness, doing the moral right thing. Doing the moral right thing. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist. This is a Hebraism, which means he's going to have a just government, okay, his kingship. And faithfulness will be the belt around his heart. A belt is what sustains everything. It'll be the sustaining factor. So it is a faithful uh, priesthood. So whenever it says a faithful uh, belt around his heart, and a faithfulness will be the belt around his heart. So he not only will have a fair and just rule as king, but he will have a faithful priesthood in which we will live. Okay, so Yahshua is the righteous. He is our righteous advocate. Yahshua Messiah, the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth to him who loves us, who cleansed us from our sins and his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God, his father. Okay, to understand the millennial kingdom, we also need to go back to 2 Peter 3.8, which reminds us that one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. There is a reason that 6,000 years ago, we are right here, by the way, this is where we are. It's been approximately 2,000 years, uh, more than 2,000 years since the birth of Jesus Christ, and it's been almost 2,000 years since his death. We are literally right here. 6,000 years ago, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, and he did it in six days. Now, why six days? He gave us a pattern. It's the one thing that every single nation agrees on. The nations don't agree on anything. They don't agree on what year it is. They don't agree on how many days in a year, but they do agree that there are seven days in a year, in a week, okay? They do agree on that. There are seven days in a week. Yahweh created the, the heavens and the earth in a literal six days and then rested the seventh day. He sanctified the seventh day. Just like a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Here we have the creation of the earth in six real days, six literal days, and then he rested on the seventh day. Now, the first day, this is, this is uh, prehistoric time before the, the flood. Everything was destroyed by the flood, which came here 1,600 years after the creation. So right about here came the flood destroying the earth. 400 years later came the calling of Abraham, the reorganization. Starting the fourth day, we have the, the judges and the kings. And then starting the fifth day, in the very middle of his very own program, Yahshua HaMashiach, 
the Messiah came to die for us. And now we've had two days of the church. So 2,000 years of church. It's an interesting dynamic because we have two days of nothing but Gentiles. There, there was not a single Jew on earth. 2,000 years, two days of nothing but Gentiles. Then we had two days, 2,000 years of Gentiles and Jews. The Jews came out of the Gentiles. Abraham was a Gentile and he became the world's first Hebrew through circumcision. Now, starting on this third period, it's almost like two, two, two. There are three periods of two, just like the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So here we have two days, but now we have three organisms. We have Gentiles, Jews, and the church. And the church is being constructed by Jews and Gentiles. So out of the Jews and the Gentiles comes this third organism, which is the church, the body of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the end of human rule and demonic rule on earth. This is the end of hu the human age. This is the sixth day. Man's number is six. This is the tribulation. This red line represents the tribulation. So that is where the seven years will come, which will bring Israel back to Yahweh. And that is the number one cause, and we've gone over that so many times. Number one cause of the tribulation is to bring an end to human rule and demonic rule on this earth. It is to finally put Satan in his place. It is finally to bring uh, Israel back to Yahweh. And uh, it is finally to set up at the end of the tribulation, the millennial reign of Christ. And you must remember that the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ is the direct fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and especially the Davidic covenant. There are so many unconditional promises made in the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant especially that have not been literally fulfilled yet. When will they have their literal and physical fulfillment in the millennial kingdom of Christ, which is the seventh day? That's why he sanctified the seventh day when he created the universe, because he knew that the seventh day of existence, the seventh period of a thousand years, would be the rule and the reign, the sanctified day of, the, of Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Then after the thousand years, we have the eighth day. In the week, the eighth day is the new beginning. In music, the eighth note is the new octave. Uh, eight is always the number of new beginnings. And in the Bible, we see that as well. Every time we see an eight mentioned, and by the way, uh, Yahshua's name is, is 888. So whenever you add up the numbers in the languages, it's 888. So it's new beginnings, that's his number. Uh, he spoke in a certain place just so that you see that the seventh day of creation is not teaching that all of us have to go to church on a Saturday. It's not talking about the seventh day as far as worshiping God. That was given to the Jews. Okay, the church, everything about the church always happens on a Sunday. Starting in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, we have the, the feast of first fruits, which is whenever you would take the, the bound sheath of uh, your first fruits to the, the high priest in the temple. You, you can take that only on the Sunday after Passover. That's the only time you can do it. It's the Sunday after Passover. And it was foreshadowing, it was anticipating the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he's our first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15. He's our first fruits. So he did that on the seventh day. He presented himself to the Father for us on the seventh day in his resurrection. Now, 50 days later, Leviticus chapter 23, you have the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost can only be celebrated on a Sunday. It's 49 days plus one for the 50 days. It's, it's the, the seven weeks after first fruits. So first fruits is a Sunday, which represents the resurrection. 50 days later and only on a Sunday, read it, Leviticus 23, you can only celebrate Pentecost on a Sunday, foreshadowing the birth of the church. Acts chapter 2. On what day was the church birthed? When, did the, when was the church born? On a Sunday. When did Jesus rise? Sunday. When, was, uh, when did he appear to his disciples the first time? Sunday. When did, uh, when did he appear again to his disciples? Eight days later, which is another Sunday. Okay, that, that's the way they speak in the Bible. So the first two appearances of Jesus Christ after his resurrection were both on Sundays. When were the, when were the apostles gathered together? On the Sunday. Uh, when did they do the collection? On a Sunday. When did Paul get together for preaching and for the Lord's Supper? On a Sunday. We've gone through all of this. The church is the new beginning. The church is the eighth day. The church is Jesus' bride. We are not Israel. I just did a huge study on that last night. Uh, well, from the time you guys are watching this a couple weeks ago. 
with our Hispanics on Wednesday night comparing the church with Israel. We are not Israel. You will cause yourself, again, insurmountable theological problems if you try saying that the, that the church is replaced Israel or is the continuation of Israel. No, 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 no. That is bad theology, and you're calling God a liar. You're calling God, even worse than that, you're calling him a pact breaker, a covenant breaker, and that, is, that does not go with Yahweh's uh, character. Okay, but now look at this verse. He spoke in a certain place about the seventh day in this way. He's talking about Genesis 2.2. God rested on the seventh day from all his work. Where do you find that? Genesis 2.2. So, he, so here in Hebrews, Paul is referencing Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, which is talking about the seventh day, all right? The seventh day of the week. He rested. He created for six days and he rested on the seventh. But he wasn't talking about the Sabbath because, you know, read Colossians chapter 2. The church is not under the law and we do not have to abide by a Sabbath. Um, our Sabbath truly should be every day. We should be glorifying God with our lives every day, uh, Okay, notice, so there remains a day of rest for the people of God. There remains one. What, what about all the Sabbaths that have already passed? We're not talking about that. The creation week, the six days and the seventh day, is not talking about Sabbath days every single week. We're talking about the millennial kingdom of Christ. Look what it says. So, that, mean, that word so means therefore. Therefore, since we're talking about God resting on the seventh day from all his work, he spoke of the seventh day in this way, therefore there remains, there's still one coming up. There remains a day of rest for the people of God. For whoever enters into God's rest will cease from his own work just as God ceased from his. So the coming seventh day is the seventh day, speaking of years like a thousand days to a year and a thousand years per day, uh, we're talking about the millennial kingdom of Christ. And by the way, whenever you, whenever you pray the Lord's prayer, which is truly the disciples' prayer, I consider John chapter 17 to be the Lord's prayer. That's him praying for himself, for his disciples, for the world. I consider Matthew 6 to be the disciples' prayer because that's where he taught us how to pray. Okay, but notice how he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Notice he said our. So this is the disciples' prayer. Uh, we'll, we'll leave John 17 as the Lord's prayer. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. What does that mean? Thy kingdom come. Do you realize that whenever we say that, pe most people pray this prayer and they have no clue as to what they're talking about. We're talking about the seventh day, the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, the most talked about period of time in the Bible, the seventh day, the, the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. Whenever we say thy kingdom come, that's what we're asking Yahweh to bring. We're saying, bring it on. We can't wait until Jesus Christ is here literally and physically ruling on the earth. So here, starting the, the third day, that's whenever Abraham came on the scene. And I know I put the numbers in the middle, but at the beginning of that third day, right there on that white line that, that Abraham seems to be looking at, uh, that's where Abraham was called, the beginning of the third day. And this was the covenant that Yahweh made with him, which is, a, which is, a, which is, an, which is an unconditional covenant. I will make a great nation of you. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Through you, all families on earth shall be blessed. Not just Israel, because remember, Abram is a, is a Gentile here. All nations, all families on earth shall be blessed through you. Okay, so because he started as a Gentile, Genesis 15, 6, he was justified by faith alone, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, while he was a Gentile. And then Paul does a Bible study in Romans chapter 4, and then all, again in Galatians chapter 3, hammering it away that we are not under the law, that we are saved by faith, just as our father Abraham was saved by faith. It is an absolute truth to say that Abraham was our father, the Gentile's father, before he became the father of the Jews, because he, he was still like 22 years away from being circumcised. And Jacob, you know... Abraham was going to have Isaac, then Isaac was going to have Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. That's where Israel began. Now, the Hebrew people started with Abraham upon circumcision. But the promise of justification by, God, by faith in Yahweh alone began while Abraham was a Gentile. 
And that, by the way, came, as Paul says in Galatians 3, came 430 years before the law of Moses. And a promise made by God to Abraham and his seed cannot be overturned or changed by a law that was only given to Israel 430 years later. That's Paul's entire argument in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. Okay. I will give this land to your seed. This is called the land covenant. This is the covenant where he says, I will give this land to your seed. Now he's talking about Israel, the, the, the national biological nation of Israel. I will give this land, Canaan, the promised land, the Middle East. I will give this land to your seed. My covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings shall come of you. Notice, I will make nations of you. You'll be the father of many nations. I will establish my covenant between me, you, and your descendants after you and their generations as an everlasting covenant. I shall be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give it to you and your seeds after you in the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan, there's the, there's the word, as an everlasting possession, I shall be their God. So this is not only the Abrahamic covenant, but it's also the land covenant. So who does the land belong to? Everything belongs to Yahweh, but who did he give it to? Israel. Uh, who does that land belong to? And what does the Bible say? Woe to the man who divides my land. It is a dangerous thing to take land away from the Jews. Yahweh has given them that land. It belongs to them. Let's fast forward a thousand years. One thousand years later, here comes David, and here's the Davidic covenant. Your house and your kingdom shall be confirmed forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, when does that begin? Because that hasn't happened yet. This promise given to David, he was an earthly king for 40 years, but it didn't take too many generations later before the whole thing was cut off. But who is the true heir of David? Who is the creator of David and the heir of David? Jesus Christ. Whenever he was born, he is the perfect fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, but not literally and physically yet. Remember whenever we studied already, not yet? We went, we went through all that. So, the true fulfillment of the Davidic covenant is whenever David is resurrected and becomes the prince in Jerusalem and Yahshua is the king in Jerusalem, being David's creator and his offspring all at the same time. And that will be the literal and physical fulfillment of the Davidic covenant and the land contract because they've never had all the promised land to them yet. But whenever Yahshua comes and sets up the millennial kingdom, they will. Now, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, unto us a child is born in the manger. Unto us a son is given on the cross. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Has that happened yet? No, not at all. But it will in the millennial kingdom. That's the fulfillment of this. Um, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Author, the Source, the Fountain, the Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government and peace. On the throne of David, ooh, what a prophecy. He's going to come from the line of Judah. He's going to be a son of David. On the throne of David and upon his kingdom. So where is he going to rule from? Jerusalem in Israel. This, this verse gives us so much insight. With justice and righteousness from this time on forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of armies will accomplish this. And he surely will. That's the seventh day. That's the millennial kingdom. Now, what Mary heard is nothing but a repetition of what David had already received. So the Davidic covenant given from Yahweh to David is, is reiterated to Mary. But everything that Mary received, besides the fact that she would carry the God-man in her womb and give birth to him, uh, besides the fact that, um, that she would be the virgin who, who would give birth to God among us, he shall be called the Son of the Most High. Yahweh God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. There is no end to Jesus' kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom now, and it'll be a physical theocratic kingdom when he comes back on the seventh day. Revelation 22, 
Yahshua says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Um, I, I couldn't give you all the verses that I didn't have space, but it says, I, Jesus, I, Yahshua, will send my angel to do this, that, and the other. And then he says, I am the root and the offspring of David. So he, he uh, identifies himself. I am the root and the offspring of David. Not only did he begin, not only is he the creator of David, but he also came from David's line in human form. All right, let's have some fun. Question, who will live in the millennial kingdom? You can probably answer this question. As a matter of fact, I hope you can. I hope every single one of you sitting here, I hope each one knows the answer to this. First of all, Yahshua. Yahshua HaMashiach, he not only lives in it, but he's going to bring it about. He's the creator of everything, and he is going to rule. Glorified beings. Now, whenever I say glorified beings, let's, let's split that into the three groups. Old Testament saints, it's for them. This is the fulfillment of all the promises made to them. This is, this is the time that is exclusively and specifically made for the saved from the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, okay, the millennial kingdom, also the raptured church. We won't be centered in Israel. We're, we're centered in heavenly places. We have the universe all over the world, just like we're the nations now and Israel is the land, well, Israel is going to be focused and concentrated in Israel, and we're just like the nations all over the earth, and because we'll be in glorified bodies, we, we'll go anywhere we want to go. It's going to be awesome. And the tribulation saints, those who uh, die, the tribulation saints are those who die during the tribulation, the martyred ones. Those who came to faith in Christ during the tribulation, but they died, well, then they are glorified and they are ushered into a very special spot in the millennial kingdom. I love uh, what it says about them. They're also going to rule and reign, but they're also going to be shepherded uh, by God himself. So it's going to be a beautiful thing. And number three, the sheep. Who are the sheep of this? The, you have survivors of the tribulation. The seven-year tribulation, you have survivors. And... Uh, some of them are called goats because they're condemned to the lake of fire. And the others are ushered into the millennial kingdom. They will still be in human bodies. They will not be glorified yet, but they're guaranteed salvation. He says, enter into the kingdom uh, given to you, you know, since before the, the world began. So they are guaranteed eternal life. Now their children are not. They're going to have to be born and come to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, but the sheep are the, are the saved ones that survive the tribulation. So those are the ones who are going to be living in the millennial kingdom. Second question of just as great of importance is who will not live in the millennial kingdom? Number one, Satan will not live in the millennial kingdom. He will be thrown into the abyss. The abyss is the bottomless pit, uh, the definition of the word and uh, the rendering of it in many places. Now, if we're to take that literally, geocentrically, it has to be at the center of the earth because geocentrically speaking, a bottomless pit, the center of the earth, every direction is up. So if you're at the center of the earth, every direction is up. So that would be the only bottomless pit. All right, so Satan will be in the abyss. The Antichrist and the false prophet will not live in the millennial kingdom because they will have already been thrown into the lake of fire. I got into a debate with somebody the other day and they said, no, the lake of fire doesn't come about until the end of the millennial reign. And I said, no, the lake of fire is there at the end of the tribulation because the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into it. And he got really mad and said, no, that's not true. And he goes, look at my graphs, look at my graphs, look at my, look at my graphs. And I said, well, let me show you the Bible. I opened up to Revelation 19 and 20, and it says that the false prophet and the, the beast, the Antichrist, were thrown into the lake of fire. He said, yeah, well, that's a different lake of fire. And I said, no, it's the same lake of fire. There's one lake of fire. He said, no, you're, you're making stuff up. I said, all right, let's flip the page. We went to the very next page in Revelation 20, and I said, look at this. Whenever Satan is released from the abyss... He will go off and deceive people. There's no war. This is the end of the millennium. This is not the war of Gog and Magog. Fire will come down from heaven and destroy them. Not a single shot will be fired. There is no war. And they will all be sent. And it says that they'll be thrown into the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet are. It's the same lake of fire. And then he had nothing to say. He, what, what can you say? I mean, there it is. I don't use graphs. I don't use what other people say. I use the Bible. And that's what I want you to do as well. We're not, denomination, we're not denominationalists, we're biblicists. Let the Bible lead us, not what somebody else wrote, not what somebody else said. Find it in the Bible. Get back to real Bible study. Search it out. 
Read, continue to read, never stop reading, make notes, connect dots, and your understanding will grow by leaps and bounds. My goal here and the purpose of this class is not so that you regurgitate what John Fox says. My point is that I want to make you better Bible studiers. I want you to fall so madly in love with the Word of God that you're in the Word of God and that you're studying the Word of God and you're allowing the Holy Spirit to, to speak through you, to move you and to teach you and to guide you and to illuminate you. Don't limit yourself by simply believing whatever some teacher says. What I'm here to tell you is Acts 17.11 says don't believe what this pastor says, what that pastor says, what this pastor says. Don't believe what John Fox says. Believe what the Word of God says. That's what Acts 17.11 says. It says those of Berea were nobler than those of Thessalonica because they received with a, with a, with a happy heart everything that was preached to them, but... They went back and, and searched the scriptures to make sure that these things were so. That's the purpose, and that's my, that, that's my goal, not only for myself, but for all of you, to study the Bible. Study the Bible for yourself. Now, where does a class like this, where does church come in? Yes, 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 you're fed. This is where you're fed. This is where, remember it says that those of Berea were nobler because they accepted what was preached to them with an open heart. You're here to learn and to grow. And you know that me being a biblicist, I'm always going to teach you straight from the Bible. But now your goal is not to say, oh, it's like this because John said it. Your goal is to say, it's like this because I learned this in church. I learned this at the Thursday night Bible study, but I went back and I, I saw it in the Bible for myself and that is how it is. So Bible study, you getting into your own Bible study is the most important thing. And that's, that's my whole goal here. All right. The false prophet, we want to glorify Yahweh with our lives. And we want to keep his word. But to keep his word, you have to read his word. The damned up to that point. Now, notice in the parentheses I put up to that point. Whenever I say the damned, I mean who will not be in the millennial kingdom? If you have been condemned, if you're not saved from the time of Adam all the way through that point, all the way through that point, you, you're still in hell. Hell and the lake of fire are two different places. It says in Revelation that hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so I think we've studied that billions of times. So all the damned are in hell up to that point because there are going to be condemned ones living in the millennial kingdom, but it's because they're living their physical human life. So imagine that the sheep who enter into the millennial kingdom, they're saved. Normal bodies, well, they're like us. We're saved, but we're not glorified yet. We're still in human bodies, right? Right? They're going to be in the same situation. They're going to know they're saved. They're ushered into the millennial kingdom, but they're in dirt bodies. They're still human beings. Now, they're saved, but they're going to have all kinds of kids over a thousand-year period. Are you kidding me? The United States is 243 years old. How many people have been born in just this country in the last 243 years? Now, imagine the entire world and imagine it over a thousand-year period. So the sheep... Those who are saved in the tribulation, those who don't die in the tribulation, and they go into the millennial kingdom um, as humans, saved humans, they're going to be marrying and having babies who are going to repopulate the millennial kingdom. Many of their children and the generations will not believe. Even though Satan's not there, even though Yahshua's ruling, all you need to be a sinner and to reject Jesus is the flesh, your sinful nature. That's all you need. We're living in a state where we have the flesh and we have the world and we have Satan walking around like a lion, like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. Uh, so there will be unsaved people living in the millennial kingdom, but it's because they're natural humans being born to those who survive the tribulation. So once they die, and if they're not saved, well, they go to the lake of fire. Um, once if they, if they die and they're saved, they'll be glorified. Um, so the damned up to that, so up to the point of that, you won't have any damned living in the millennial kingdom except natural human beings that are being born into the millennial kingdom. Okay, here we are, verse six. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse six. Beautiful verse, very well known. The wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf, the young lion, the fatling will graze together, and a little child will lead them. Notice that even though the curse has not been lifted yet, there's still death, 
and there's still sin. As we see at the end of the millennium, there's still sin, there's still rebellion, and there's still death. We're, we're going to see that a little bit later. But the curse has been partially lifted. The curse that we're living in right now, that most people don't live to be 100, that there's sickness and death and, and, and miscarriages and bad stuff. We're living under the curse. Uh, didn't you know? <laughs> uh, but in the millennial kingdom, even though there still will be a curse, there'll still be death, there'll still be sin. It, the, there will be a partial lifting of the curse, especially with the relationships, with the lifespans of humans, with the understanding of humans, because all will have the ability to understand the gospel, and the animal kingdom. Uh, since Genesis chapter 9, we've been eating meat, and the animals have been terrified of us. Okay, unless they've been domesticated, as James says. But in the millennial kingdom, there will be a partial lifting of the curse. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. Does that happen today? Not unless they grow up together, and even then it's dangerous. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. Does that happen today? Not unless they're brought up together, and even then it's dangerous. The calf, the young lion, and the fatling will graze together, and a little child will lead them. Would you like your little child leading the young lion, uh, the fatling, the ox, the wolf? Would you like a little child leading them? In the millennial kingdom, they'll be able to, just like this painting depicts. While the cow and the bear feed, their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. And don't let that confuse you or don't let that bewilder you. Because look up, and I think you already have, I think you've already checked this out. Um, I think whenever I preached this to the Hispanics, I'd had, I had several of our Hispanics actually said, yes, we did look it up because I, I told them this before. They looked it up and they found it. There are many circuses on earth that have lions, and until they introduce them to blood and meat, the lions are drawn to and are more than happy to live on a vegetarian diet. They eat straw, they eat vegetables, they eat whatever's put in front of them, and they don't try to attack or kill anything because they haven't been introduced to blood. Well, and, and so it's a normal thing. And before Genesis 9, there were no carnivores. It was Genesis chapter 9 when, uh, when carnivores were born, okay? So, um, while the cow and the bear feed, their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing infant will play near the cobra's den. And the toddler's hand will reach into the viper's nest. Does this sound far-fetched? Not when a curse has been lifted. Why do we have these things happening now? Because of a curse on this earth. Hostility even among the creation. But in the millennial kingdom, that curse will be partially lifted. Uh, I love what it says in Isaiah 65. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox and the serpent will eat dust. Nothing will harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain, declares Yahweh. And don't let that confuse you either. Whenever it says, in all my holy mountain, don't think Mount Moriah. Okay, ever on earth, there's destruction and lions eating babies. Yet, on Mount Moriah, by the way, if you look up Mount Moriah, the, the temple mount in Jerusalem, the, the altitude, the, the height is 777 meters. Just look that up. It's amazing. It's like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, 21. So 777 meters above sea level is Mount Moriah, the... Um, the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem. Uh, coincidence? There, there are no coincidences in the Bible. Everything is done for a reason. But whenever it says, nothing will harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain, declares Yahweh. Remember that in the millennial kingdom, he is not just the king of Jerusalem. He is not just the king of the Middle East. He is king of kings, Lord of lords. He is king over the entire earth. Remember Daniel chapter 2. We went through Daniel. And whenever we went through the chapter 2 of Daniel... Uh, the rock that was cut out of the mountain without hands and it came down and destroyed all the other kingdoms of earth. And then the mountain grew and covered the entire earth. A mountain in the Bible represents power. It represents a government. So who is going to rule the earth? Yahshua in the millennial kingdom. Whenever it says nothing will harm or destroy in all my holy mountain, remember mountain doesn't just mean a physical structure. It means his rule, his reign, his headship. And that, like Daniel 2 says, will cover the entire earth. So on earth, nothing will harm nor destroy because he will have partially lifted the curse. Nine, 
Nothing will cause harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain for the whole earth. There you go. What did I just tell you? The whole earth. For the whole earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh, just as the oceans are full of water. In that day, there will be a root of Jesse, and he will be the people's banner. The Gentiles will seek him, and his rest will be glorious. His rest. What are we talking about? The seventh day. His rest. That is the, the euphemism for the, the millennial kingdom of Christ. His rest. So this is also a proof that the Bible has not been tampered with. First of all, it's ridiculous to even say that because there are so many copies and they're so widely distributed. If you change the Bible, you'd have to go around the earth, collect all the different translations and all the different versions and change them all. Otherwise, you're going to be the one that looks like you're the only one that is the odd man out with a weird Bible that says something that it shouldn't. So the fact that it says that God will save the Gentiles here, to a Jew, they call us uh, uh, dogs and unclean. That is, if the, if the Jews were going to change or manipulate the Bible in any way, this verse would not be there. The fact that this verse is there is proof that although there was a time and still today that they consider the Jews dogs and unclean. You know, we love them and they're our, our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, this is the verse they would have removed. And all the verses throughout the, the Old Testament talking about God saving the Gentiles. It's, it's all over the place. Uh, in Isaiah 65, there will no longer be, and I love this. Are you ready for this? I told you about miscarriages. There will no longer be an infant who only lives a few days. That will no longer happen. Do you know how it affects a woman, how it can affect a woman whenever she, she knows that there's a life growing in her, but it dies before it can be born, or it's born and then it dies after just a few days? That is so devastating to a family and especially to the mother. So in the millennial kingdom, again, a partial lifting of the curse, and that will no longer happen. There will no longer be miscarriages. There will no longer be infant deaths ever. Look what it says. There will no longer be... An infant, that means not, not even one, not even one. There will no longer be an infant who lives only a few days or an old man who has not lived out his days. Anyone who dies being 100 years old will be called a mere child. So there's still death because it, the curse hasn't been totally lifted and there's still humans, those repopulating the earth. But if you don't live to be at least 100, you're going to be considered accursed. They're going to say, that dude only lived to be 100? Man, he was just a kid. What a difference, because now if we live to be 100, it's like, wow, that's, a, that's an accomplishment. It's like the extreme of someone living to, to be 100. But in, in the millennial kingdom, it'll be unheard of to have someone die at only 100 years of age. And then look at this. They will no longer build just so that another can live there. And they will no longer plant just so that another can eat its fruit. Whatever you do, you're going to have. Whatever you build, you're going to have. Whatever you plant, you're going to eat. You're going to enjoy it. So notice that these are still natural humans. For my people will live to be as old as trees. And just so you know, the oldest tree on earth right now is the Methuselah tree. I forget where it is, but it's 4,000 years old. 4,000 years old. Um, isn't that interesting that the flood of Noah was 4,400 years ago? So there is no tree on earth that dates back before the flood of Noah. Everything was destroyed. So look it up, the Methuselah tree. Look it up, I, I strongly encourage you to. Um, it says, for my people will live to be as old as trees. So how long do trees normally live? Hundreds of years, hundreds, maybe a thousand years. So maybe some people will last the entire length of the millennial kingdom. Maybe some people will last half. But if you live to only be 100, you're going to be considered a mere child. <laughs> My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still praying, I will have already heard. That's swift justice. That's him knowing what we're praying before we do it. Now we pray and we have faith that he's going to answer. But in the millennial kingdom, before you pray, I will have answered. And while you're still praying, I will have already heard. So one or the other, in other words, it's a quick hearing. It's going to be instant, instant reaction. Now, I put some verses at the top of your screen, the Matthew 22, the Mark 12, the Luke 20. I put those verses to help you. This, this is actually part of your apologetics here tonight. 
Uh, all those verses say that no one will be given in marriage nor married in the regeneration, which we're talking millennial kingdom, eternal state. Yet, here I am telling you that people, there will be human beings in this world getting married, having children. So somebody, I always, I try to anticipate questions or misunderstandings. Remember that there are two different types of people living in the millennial kingdom. We have glorified saints. Those are either Israel in their land or the church married to Jesus Christ. They are not given in marriage or married. We're already married to Jesus Christ and Israel is married to the Father. The marriages that are happening in the millennial kingdom are among the natural human beings. So whenever you read in Matthew 22 and Mark 12 and Luke 20, it's talking about us. It says, the children of the regeneration, in the regeneration. Okay, we're regenerated. We're glorified. So glorified beings will not be married or given in marriage because we have one husband, Yahshua. Israel is married to the Father. Yet, in the millennial kingdom, the natural humans, they're not regenerated yet. That's the point. So you have to compare apples to apples. They're not regenerated yet. They're still natural humans. They will be given in marriage and married and they'll be having children to repopulate the earth. So don't let that confuse you and don't let like a contradiction pop up in your head because there is no contradiction. Okay, second to last screen. And this is for our encouragement. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 17. This is why everything we've studied tonight, this is why the millennial reign, the glorification, the regeneration, the beauty of God's kingdom this is why we don't lose heart. We don't faint. We don't give up. Because though our outer man, this dirt body, is under the bondage of decay, that's the curse, the inner man is renewed day by day. Our spirit is growing from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18. We're growing from glory to glory through the Holy Spirit of Yahweh. We are His. We're being renewed on the inside even though our outside is falling apart. For our light affliction... This life, 70 years plus or minus, or until Yahshua calls us to heaven, our light affliction, which is only for a moment. How fast is life? Too fast. This light affliction, which is only for a moment, produces for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Your glorification, your rewards, your inheritance in the kingdom, amazing things. And by the way, we are the examples. In the millennial kingdom, say millennial kingdom, millennial kingdom, right? In the millennial kingdom, they will not be walking only by faith, but by sight. They're going to see us in glorified bodies. They're going to see us walking through walls. They're going to see us flying around. They're going to see Yahshua on his throne in Jerusalem. They're going to see the Bible, that everything ever written in the Bible exactly came true. And yet, if they don't put their faith, if they don't confide, if they don't put their same trust in Yahshua, they won't be saved. Yet they see him. So it's not just walking by faith in those days, though they will have to confide, trust in Yahshua to be saved. Many of them will not, as the Bible says, it says they're like the sand of the seashore. Many of them will not because they won't believe it. They'll probably think that they can't be saved. It's not fair. They're in dirt bodies. They have you know, they, things are tough for them. They can't walk through walls. They can't fly. They look at us and perhaps there's an envy. Perhaps because there's instant justice, uh, Jesus will rule with an iron rod. What happens to the human being whenever he's stopped before he sends? What happens to the human being that you tell no to? They want to be left to their own devices. Human beings want to do as they please, when they please, with whom they please, as often as they please. That's what the human being wants to do. And whenever you have so many glorified beings policing and governing and ruling and reigning, we're kings and priests with Jesus Christ, and whenever Jesus has, it rules with an iron rod, that means swift justice. That means no one's going to get away with anything. You understand that? Humans don't like that. Humans like to hide. Humans like to disappear in the darkness. Humans like to do things when no one else is watching so they can get away with it. And then they say, ah, either there is no God or he's not even watching me. There is no consequence. That's what human beings say. 
in the millennial kingdom, it won't be that. There will be many. In the book of Revelation, it says at the end of the millennial kingdom, those who rebel and reject Yahshua and who join with Satan will be like the sand of the seashore. And they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. But notice that we will be the examples. It says, so that in the ages to come, ages to come, what does that mean? We're in the church age. There's only two ages that come in the future. There's the tribulation and there's the millennial kingdom. And then of course, eternity, which is the eternal state. So, so that in the eight, but by that time, everyone will be saved. Everyone will be glorified. So we won't, there won't need to be an example. So we're talking about the tribulation. Can you imagine living through that hellacious time period? And then the millennial kingdom of Christ. So that in the ages, two, we're talking about two, the tribulation, the millennial kingdom of Christ. So that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace through his kindness toward us and Yahshua Messiah. In other words, in the ages to come, who's going to be the example? We are. Yahshua is going to say, and we're going to be saying, trust in Yahshua, put your faith in him because he's the savior. Look at us. We're living proof. We lived in human bodies just like y'all. No, you didn't. You've always been like this. Y'all are probably just aliens. If people are already saying stuff like that, that's probably what they're going to say to us in those days. They're going to say, no, you never had to go through what I'm going through. You never had Yahshua with an iron rod ruling over you. No, I had to walk with my conscience and with the Holy Spirit in me, knowing that even though there wasn't swift justice, there is a God that I had to give an account to at the end of my life. And look, he saved me by his grace. I never saw him. You get to see him. There he is. He never talked to me. Look, he's talking to you. I never saw an angel, or, or not that I know of, I never saw a glorified saint like you're looking at me right now. I never got to walk by sight. I walked by faith only by what this book, this book here, the Bible, only by what it says. What did Jesus say to Thomas? You believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe, who have not seen and yet believe. This is what this verse is all about. So that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace through his kindness toward us in Yahshua Messiah. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. Your salvation is the gift of God. Your salvation is not by works. Your salvation is nothing that you can boast over. For we are his poem, his masterwork, his work of art, his workmanship, created in Yahshua Messiah for good works, saved by faith, saved for good works in which God has preordained that we should walk. He's littered our lives with opportunities to do good for his glory. Our job is to recognize those opportunities and walk in them. And you guys, we are going to be the examples of God's goodness and grace in the ages to come. How exciting is this? How exciting. And that brings us to the end of our lesson here tonight. Oh, and I think 2 Peter 3.11 makes a really good end to our study about the millennial kingdom. Now, seeing that all these things will be dissolved, what kind of people should you be in all holy conduct and godliness? Great question. How should we live our lives knowing that our king is coming for us very soon? We should love him with our whole heart, mind, soul, strength, and being. We should love our neighbors as ourselves. We should love the church as Jesus loves the church. What a, what a command. We should keep his word. We, you have to read his word to keep his word. And read it for yourself. Get into the Bible. Make it your daily bread. Evangelize. If you actually take one, two, three, and four seriously, if you actually take those first four seriously, guess what you will be compelled to do? Guess what you will be constrained to do? Guess what you will not be able to help but do? Evangelize. Sharing the word, preaching the gospel. How much you have to hate someone to be around them every day and to never share the gospel. You're basically saying to them, I don't care if you go to hell. How's that? And once you evangelize them, you don't leave a newborn baby on the operating table. You disciple them, walk with them, teach them, bring them, bring them to Bible study. We'll take care of the rest and pray. Pray without ceasing, remembering who you are and whose you are. Therefore, let's live accordingly to our culture in Christ. Let's pray. 
Yahweh, thank you for these two weeks. By this time, I will have been almost two weeks in Scotland, and this will be the second recorded service for my brothers and sisters on Thursday night. I thank you for their attendance. I thank you for their dedication to this Thursday night Bible study and their dedication to you, Father God Almighty. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for teaching us and guiding us. Uh, please bring me back safely from Scotland so that I can be here physically uh, to see my brothers and sisters and to continue studying your perfect word. Thank you for Isaiah chapter 11. And it's in the name of Yahshua, our Lord and Savior, that we pray. Amen.